good afternoon everyone so uh, today we'll discuss about uh, protected areas right so there is a third topic protected areas species will be discussing we'll come uh, to species later because initially we'll discuss about protected areas because the number of species that we have discussed and a uh, few species are also left so few species we'll discuss later so right now we'll discuss about protected areas so third third section in your current affairs magazine is protected areas so those protected areas we'll discuss right and this topic not only includes protected areas also it includes uh, wetlands right ramsar convention comes up with the or uh, various sites various wetland sites are declared as ramsar sites under ramsar convention so those are also are also considered under the topic of protected areas fine but they are not exactly protected areas that you should be aware of so as we have discussed yesterday there are four different types of protected areas that we have they are national parks fine wildlife sanctuaries fine conservation reserves and community reserves and also tiger reserves so these are these are protected areas which are backed by statute which are backed by wildlife protection act 1972 right but apart from these protected areas there are certain other protected areas that you must be aware of elephant reserves elephant reserves right biosphere reserves biosphere reserves anything else bird sanctuaries are are wildlife sanctuaries only but wildlife sanctuaries are created can be created wildlife sanctuaries can be created for certain species right so they are bird uh, they are under wildlife sanctuaries only marine protected areas marine protected areas fine so these are also other types of protected areas fine one more is biodiversity heritage sites biodiversity heritage sites this is important from the cs perspective bhs because in tamil nadu one biodiversity heritage site was created recently right you must be aware of so uh, you must be aware of basic differences between these protected areas can you please tell me the basic difference between national parks wildlife sanctuaries conservation reserves community reserves and all yes in national parks strict protection strict protection is given to wildlife as as no human activity is permitted as no human activity is permitted right so strict protection is there to wildlife in national parks fine in wildlife sanctuaries there is a protection there is a protection to wildlife but at the same time human activities human activities may be permitted may be permitted and who will permit those human activities cww it is chief wildlife warden cww permits those kind of activities fine even grazing activity of grazing is not is not banned is not prohibited under wildlife sanctuaries that will be means it is cww who will decide whether it should be allowed prohibited or regulated that will be decided by chief wildlife warden of that particular state and chief wildlife warden as we have discussed yesterday is an office which will be administrative head of protected areas in that particular state fine right? then conservation reserves so in the original wildlife protection act these were the two protected areas national parks and 
wildlife sanctuaries. But later on, in order to recognize the role of community in conservation, conservation reserves and community reserves were added with the amendment, with the amendment to Wildlife Protection Act in in 2002, in 2002, in 2006, NTPA, uh, sorry, NTCA was was added, right, as a statutory organization. These were added with the amendment of 2002. So, what is conservation reserve? How it is different from community reserve? Conservation reserve. Can you please tell me? This is important again. Conservation reserve is important. Why? Because conservation reserve, as per Wildlife Protection Amendment Bill 2021, can also be notified by central government. Right? Right now, it is done by state, but it may means if that act, if that bill is uh, is given assent to by by the president, it will become act. And one of the provisions under that is that central government can also notify conservation reserves. Right? That's why it is very important from the CS perspective. Yes, conservation reserves. Sir, place fine, fine. Conservation reserves can be created on those la lands which are which are uh, on the periphery of existing protected areas. Land which is connecting to protected areas can also be declared as conservation reserve. Fine. So it is done by state. As of now, it is done by state government on government-owned land on government owned land fine so that is an important point government owned land fine community community reserve on the other hand are also they are also notified by state government but on on community community or individually owned land where that community or individual has volunteered to surrender their land for the conservation. Fine. So that is the difference between community reserves and conservation reserves that you should be aware of. Right? And then tiger reserves. Tiger reserves. Tiger reserves are created by? Fine. Under, uh, they, they also have statutory recognition. They are created by state governments on the recommendations of on the recommendations of ntca ntca national tiger conservation authority fine and you must be aware tiger reserves they follow core buffer strategy core buffer strategy is followed in in tiger reserves fine so core area of tiger reserve is that area where where strict protection will be given to tigers right but at the same time we will also balance the rights of rights of forest dwellers forest dwelling scheduled tribes their rights will also be balanced fine so core area who will determine the core area of tiger reserve it is determined by state in consultation with expert committee in consultation with expert committee fine and then we have buffer zone buffer zone of tiger reserve in buffer zone buffer zone is a uh, region which will be lying uh, on the peripheral region of core zone and in buffer zone certain human activities will also be permitted like grazing Grazing will be permitted. Grazing is not allowed in core. Collection of minor forest produce is also allowed in buffer zone. Fine. Who will notify? Who will de determine the boundaries of buffer zone? It will be determined by the concerned Gram Sabha. Concerned Gram Sabha in consultation with expert committee. In consultation with expert committee fine so these are these are uh, the protected areas backed by wildlife protection act 1972 then elephant reserves so elephant reserves are created under project 
project elephant created under project elephant when it was started project elephant 1992 fine project elephant and uh, who who creates these uh, elephant reserves these are created by moef and cc these are created by moef and cc fine next biosphere reserves what are biosphere reserves biosphere reserves fine fine see biosphere reserves are are a part of map program map program of unesco map program of unesco but not all biosphere reserves but not all biosphere reserves and there is no uh, criteria given by unesco which biosphere reserves will be a part of map program right you must have heard about wnbr there is one article uh, there is one uh, biosphere reserves that we'll be discussing so there you will come across this term wnbr world network for biosphere reserves so it is a network of those biosphere reserves which are a part of map program right it is a network of those biosphere reserves which are a part of map program fine that does not mean that does not mean biosphere reserves cannot be created outside of map program there are 18 biosphere reserves in india out of which only 12 are a part of wnbr and those map program fine so that is an important point and again in biosphere reserves also we have three zones three zones are there in biosphere reserves they are core zone buffer zone and and transitional zone transitional zone right and core zone is no go zone it is uh, meant for protection of that particular wildlife then uh, in buffer zone there will be certain activities which will be permitted and it is it acts as a kind of shock absorber for core zone and then in the transitional zone most of the activities will be permitted fine so that is biosphere reserves marine protected areas mpas marine protected areas marine protected areas so these are the protected areas in aquatic ecosystem where human activities will be restricted compared to adjacent water compared to adjacent water human activities will be restricted in these marine protected areas and marine protected areas can be created by states uts local bodies and even by central government even by central government right so there is no fixed criteria there is no fixed uh, fixed criteria for the declaration of marine protected areas as there is no statute to back marine protected areas they can be created by local bodies they can be created by state governments uts and even by central government right and then we have bio biodiversity heritage sites bhs have you heard about this biodiversity heritage sites created by created by state governments bhs are created by state governments on the recommendations of on the recommendations of sbb state biodiversity board on the recommendations of state biodiversity board and see recommend not recommendations on the advice of right on the advice of state biodiversity board state governments create biodiversity heritage sites fine and what is sbb state biodiversity board is it a statutory organization fine fine under biodiversity act we have three important institutions that you should be aware of at the national level we have national biodiversity authority nba which will advise central government with respect to implementation of with respect to implementation of goals of cbd right goals of cbd need to be achieved in india so who will advise government of india to uh, in order to achieve those goals it will be nba national biodiversity authority 
right can you please tell me three goals of cbd three important goals of cbd fine first is conservation of biodiversity second sustainable use of biodiversity resources right sustainable use of biodiversity resources and third is once you do once you carry out sustainable use you will be receiving some benefits those benefits should be shared in fair and equitable manner with the with all the stakeholders that is goal number 3 right and in order to implement in order to achieve goal number 3 which protocol is there nagoya nagoya protocol is there fine so uh, to advise central government under biodiversity act there is national biodiversity authority to advise state government with respect to achievement of goals of cbd there is authority there is one board called as state biodiversity board right state biodiversity board is also a statutory organization under bda biodiversity Uh, act biodiversity act 2002 fine and then at the local level we have extremely important body called as biodiversity management committee bmc right why they are extremely important because they document they carry out documentation of biodiversity not only biodiversity resources but also traditional knowledge because it is also a kind of it is also a kind of biodiversity service that we receive from from biodiversity resources fine and that's why it should also be protected right and uh, that documentation is done by bmc fine so that is biodiversity heritage sites right so these are certain important protected areas that we have apart from these protected areas there are certain other terms for example ramsar sites ramsar sites are also there what are ramsar sites right these are the wetlands notified under ramsar convention right these are the wet, uh, wetlands notified under ramsar convention and who notifies uh, these these uh, ramsar sites sir there are ramsar conditions fine there are nine criteria we'll be discussing there is one uh, article on ramsar sites we'll discuss that there are nine criteria but on the basis of those nine criteria moef and cc on the recommendations of national wetlands committee uh, comes up with the list of internationally important wetlands also called as ramsar sites fine so that is what we have discussed next now so uh, let us come uh, let us start our discussion of this these topics so is it clear right so there are these different protected areas that we are going to discuss so you should be aware of these terms so that we can use them directly during our discussion any doubt in this no fine so you can come to page number 53 53 uh, one more is there one more is there before we proceed one more it is not a protected area per se ibas important bird areas important bird areas these i think we have discussed it yesterday so important bird areas are are created by or are notified by bird life international bird life international in association with its local partners or regional partners ibas important bird areas we have discussed it yesterday so you can come to page number 54 now page number 54 so first topic is is water bird census survey 2022 conducted in chilka lake right so this this article per se is not very important because it is uh, a water bird census water bird survey for for species or birds in chilka lake right so it, that specific uh, it's very difficult to it's very difficult that ups means there are rare chances that upsc will ask question on these kind of questions right so what is important is chilka lake right where is chilka lake chilka lake is in in odisha so it is a brackish water lagoon lake it is a brackish water lagoon lake and it is there in 
districts like Puri, Kordha and Ganjam district of Odisha. Right? And it is formed because of uh, the mouth of which river? River Daya river. River Daya. And it is second largest, second largest lake after Vembanad Lake. Vembanad Lake, where it is? Kerala. Vembanad Lake is in Kerala and it is the largest lake. After that, it is Chilka Lake. Fine. And inside Chilka Lake, there is one bird sanctuary called as Nalabana. Nalabana bird sanctuary is there inside Chilka Lake. Nalabana. Fine. So, as per this survey, as per this survey which was conducted in 2022, number of birds in Chilka Lake reduced. Number of birds in Chilka Lake reduced. And why, what was the reason behind the decrease in the number of birds? First, decrease is attributed to high water levels and presence of water in cultivated fields in the adjoining areas because high water levels, they they reduce the availability of mud. They reduce the availability of mud flats which are preferred by birds. Right? Birds prefer mud flats in order to carry out their nesting and breeding activities. So those mud flats, they do not get when level of water increases. So that increased level of water was attributed to fall in the number of birds in Chilka Lake. Fine? So that is one. Then, uh, which kind of species are found in the Chilka Lake? First is, first and most important species is uh, Mongolian Gull. So, in the recent survey, in the survey that they carried out in 2022, they have found Mongolian Gull in uh, Chilka Lake, which is not common to Chilka Lake. Mongolian Gull is a bird species. So, you can remember this name. So, Mongolian Gull is generally found in Northeastern Asia northeastern parts of Asia. That means you can uh, say around uh, Mongolia and Chinese region. In those region we can find Mongolian gul. Fine? So that is first. That is first topic. Water survey carried out in Chilka Lake. What is important is river. Which river? Daya river. Secondly, Nalabana uh, bird sanctuary which is there inside Chilka Lake and thirdly, Mongolian gul. Mongolian gul. Fine? Next now. Next is Asian water bird census. Asian water bird census. Can you please tell me who carries out Asian water bird census? Asian water bird census is carried out wet by Wetlands International along with Wetlands International, BNHS, Bombay Natural History Society. These two organizations, these are NGOs, they carry out Asian water bird census, Wetlands International and BNHS. And this Asian water bird census is carried out every year in the month of January. In the month of January, this water bird census is carried out. Fine. And uh, this, this article is about uh, the water bird, water bird census that they carried out in one of the lakes in, in Delhi. It is Sanjay Lake where they have found less number of birds compared to earlier census. Fine. So, important is, important is Asian water bird census is carried out by Wetlands International along with that BNHS, Bombay Natural History Society. Next now. And uh, one more point, one more point is important. It was initiated in Indian subcontinent in 1987. Initiated in Indian subcontinent in 1987. Fine. Next now. Next is Behali Reserve Forest. Behali Reserve Forest. Where it is? It is there in the state of Assam. It is there in the state of Assam. In the foothills of eastern Himalayas, we have this Behali Reserve Forest. And uh, this Behali Reserve Forest is a part of Sonitpur. Sonitpur Elephant Reserve. Sonitpur Elephant Reserve. Fine. And uh, this reserve forest, it connects two important protected areas in the state of Assam. First is Nameri National Park and second is Kaziranga. 
right nameri national park and kaziranga national park are connected by are connected by this bihali reserve forest and we have already discussed about reserve forest reserve forests are created under indian forest act 27 fine so uh, one more important point for this bihali reserve forest it is also recognized as iba important bird area in 1994 it was recognized as iba and key biodiversity area key biodiversity area so who recognizes who creates key biodiversity areas can you please tell me and this point is important key biodiversity areas are are created by are recognized by iucn right you can write this point key biodiversity area are recognized by iucn next what are key bio key biodiversity areas key biodiversity areas under that these are the areas these are the areas that contribute to these are the areas that contribute to contribute to the persistence of biodiversity contribute to the persistence of biodiversity persistence of biodiversity biodiversity can continue in these areas comma and they act as vital habitat and they act as vital habitat for for threatened plant and animal species for threatened plant and animal species key biodiversity areas fine so those those areas which can help in the persistence of biodiversity and which are acting as habitat for threatened species of plants and animals those areas will be recognized as key biodiversity areas by iucn and this bihali reserve forest is one of the key biodiversity areas fine so that point is important next now so uh, that was the fourth topic bihali reserve forest next orang orang national park orang national park where in the state of assam yesterday while discussing indian rhino vision we have discussed about orang national park it is there in the state of assam and it is shared by two districts darang and sonitpur district darang and sonitpur district fine and uh, which river lies uh, besides orang national park it is brahmaputra brahmaputra river along with one horn rhino this this uh, orang national park is also a habitat to pygmy hawk pygmy hawk right what is iucn status of pygmy hawk critically endangered it is critically endangered then we also have asian elephants bengal tigers in this orang national park fine so important are great indian one horn rhino pygmy hawk next so uh, in this in this orang national park we have maljuria elephants maljuria elephants what is that so in bracket it has given it is a group of male elephants maljuria elephants means a group of male elephants fine so that is about this orang national park next now asola asola wildlife sanctuary where border region of delhi and haryana border region of delhi and haryana and this uh, asola asola bhatti wildlife sanctuary is a part of nadan aravalli leopard wildlife corridor starting from sariska national park in rajasthan and ending to ending at delhi ridge right delhi ridge is a region where what is delhi ridge 
Delhi Ridge. Fine, it is an extension of Aravalis, right? Aravalis were uh, were uh, were extended in a large geographical area in the historic past, but they have undergone uh, various erosional activities, and as a result of those erosion, uh, those erosional activities, we have only parts of Aravalis left. So the part of Aravalli in in and around Delhi is called as Delhi Ridge. Fine. Next, and here in Asola Bhatti Wildlife Sanctuary, which species of animals are important? As name suggests, Aravalli Leopard Wildlife Corridor. Leopards are first. Leopards, then Sambar, Hog Deer, Nilgai, Black Buck, and even Spotted Deer. So these animal species are important in this Asola Bhatti Wildlife Sanctuary. Along with that, it is also a habitat to various kinds of birds. <coughs> Next, so uh, where is Sariska Tiger Reserve? Sariska Tiger Reserve, it is there in Rajasthan and it was in news in 2022 because of the instances of forest fire. Right? Sariska was affected by forest fire. And why it, is, why it was affected by forest fire? Why it was affected by forest fire? First, because of the type of vegetation that is there in Sariska. In Sariska, we have thorny vegetation, we have dry deciduous vegetation and also we have grasses. Grasslands are also there. So, we know that grasses are prone to fire, right? You must be aware of, uh, you must be aware of Savana region. In Savana, we have pyrophytes. What are pyrophytes? Though that vegetation which is fire loving vegetation. They use fire for various purposes. They use fire for nutrient cycling. They use fire for germination of seed as well. Right? So pyrophytes are there in, in savannas. Right? So uh, tropical grasslands are called as savanna. And this region, Sariska Tiger Reserve also consists of tropical grassland. That means uh, the grassland similar to savanna, right? And that's why it is. And so added to this, first is first is that there is availability of raw material for forest fires. Along with that, water scarcity, right? This region uh, is there in the uh, is is there in the uh, that part of India where rainfall is less than rainfall is less than seventy five centimeters. So because of wa water scarcity drier conditions prevail in this area and that's why uh, in 2022 we witnessed the instances of forest fire fine next which are the important species in sariska apart from tigers apart from tigers there are leopards write down these things tigers leopards nilgai tigers leopards nilgai sambar and cheetal and Cheetal. Fine. So that is about Sariska Tiger Reserve. It was created as a tiger reserve in 1978. Not very important. Next now, Pinch. Pinch Tiger Reserve. Where? Fine. It is there in MP. So uh, Pinch Tiger Reserve. It is there in the southern slopes of Satpuda ranges. In the sat southern so slope of Satpuda ranges, we have Pinch Tiger Reserve. And it is straddle across MP and Maharashtra. Right? So, uh, in Maharashtra, there is a uh, tiger reserve called as Tadoba. Tadoba. So, Tadoba and Pinch are, uh, are the tiger reserves which are, which are adjacent to each other. So, southern slopes of uh, Satpuda. Next, which river flows through it? River Pench. River Pench flows through it. And in 1999, it was declared as a tiger reserve. Two districts, two districts like Seoni and Chindwara district of Madhya Pradesh are the districts which, uh, which have the presence of Pench. And also, it is there in uh, Nagpur district. See, Pench National Park is there in Madhya Pradesh. Pench National Park is there in Madhya Pradesh. Pench Tiger Reserve 
is straddle across Maharashtra as well as as well as Madhya Pradesh. Fine. So in Chindwara and uh, Sioni district of Madhya Pradesh, we have Pinch Tiger Reserve, and also in Nagpur district of Maharashtra. Next now, next is Kevla Dev National Park. Kevla Dev National Park, also called as Bharatpur Bird Sanctuary. Bharatpur Bird Sanctuary. Right, and we have already discussed about the two important tags that it has got. First is that, first is, it is a part of Ramsar list. It is a part of Ramsar list. Secondly, it is also a part of Montrex record. Right. And one more, it is also a world heritage site. It is also a world heritage site. Fine, so we have already discussed about Kevla Dev. Next, Ramgad Vishdhari Tiger Reserve. Ramgad Vishdhari Tiger Reserve, where? Again, in the state of Rajasthan. So, this is the fourth tiger reserve in the state of Rajasthan. Can you name other three? First is Sariska, second, Ranthambore, third, third is Mukundra Hill Tiger Reserve, right? So third is Mukundra Hill Tiger Reserve and now fourth one is Ramgad Vishdhari. So this is the fourth Tiger Reserve in Rajasthan and it is recent Tiger Reserve, right? Recently uh, four Tiger Reserves were added, under that Ramgad Vishdhari is one. Others are like Tamur Pingla, then uh, Guru Ghasidas and one more. Muddu Malai, I think in Tamil Nadu, right? So these are the recent additions to the list of tiger reserves. Next, next is uh, Biligiri Ranganath Swami Temple Tiger Reserve. Biligiri Ranganath Swami Temple Tiger Reserve, BRT Tiger Reserve, created in 2011. It was created in 2011, and it is there in the Chamaraj. Nagar district of Karnataka, Chamaraj Nagar district of Karnataka and it is situated between Western Ghats and Eastern Ghats. It is situated between the bridge, as a bridge between Western Ghats and Eastern Ghats. Fine, so that is BRT. Next, next is India's first geological park named uh, or in Lamheta village. Lamheta village, it is there in the state of Madhya Pradesh. Fine, so who creates geological parks? Geological Survey of India, GSI, it is the organization which was formed in 1851, headquartered at GSI, headquartered at Kolkata. GSI is headquartered at Kolkata, right, and it is a scientific body, scientific body under which ministry? Ministry of Mines, under Ministry of Mines, fine, next, so uh, this Lamheta village in Madhya Pradesh is already present in the tentative list of UNESCO's Geo Heritage uh, for the Protection of Natural Heritage, right, so it is not there as of now, but it is in the tentative list, it may be added in that particular list. So why, why this particular site is important because in this site we have found the fossils of dinosaurs. In the uh, in Lamheta village we have found the fossils of dinosaurs and that is why it was given a tag of geological park by GSI. Fine. Next now. Next is Khijadiya Wildlife Sanctuary. Khijadiya Wildlife Sanctuary, where? Gujarat. Khijadiya Wildlife Sanctuary is there in Gujarat. And it was declared as a Ramsar site. Khijadiya Wildlife Sanctuary in uh, Gulf of Kutch region has been declared as a Ramsar site. Right? Can you please tell me what are Ramsar sites?
fine. So these areas, Ramsar sites are the areas of wetlands and uh, Ramsar sites are the sites where, where wetland resources are used in such a way that there is no change in the ecological characteristic of that wetland, right? And that, that is what is called as wise use of wetlands under Ramsar Convention, right? This, this use where we are ensuring that there is no change in the ecological characteristic is called as wise use of wetlands. And this question was asked by UPSC, not in prelims exam, but in mains they have asked this question in 2019. What is wise use of wetlands under Ramsar Convention? Right, so wise use means to make, to use wide, uh, to use wetland resources in such a way that there is no change in the ecological characteristic of that wetland. If that wetland is used as a source of food by, let's say, fishes, then it should remain that way. If it is used as a nesting and breeding site uh, by by water birds, it should remain that way. Right? If it is a source of water for near for nearby community it should remain that way, it should not be converted into terrestrial ecosystem by adding foreign material. So if that is done, then there is harm to ecological characteristic and that is that will not be considered as a wise use of wetlands, fine. And if wise use is not there, what will happen? Change ho jayega, change ho gaya to kya hoga? Montrex. Montrex record, it will be a part of Montrex record then, right? So this is Khijadia and uh, this, this is a freshwater wetland, Khijadia wildlife sanctuary is a freshwater wetland and it was formed uh, following the creation of a bund which is a kind of dike to protect farmland from salt water, right? So what is a dike? which kind of landform it is? Volcanic, right? Intrinsic volcanic landform is called as dike. It is a vertical structure. So that kind of structure was created to protect farmland from salt water, right? And that's why there is a creation of, uh, you can say, freshwater ecosystem, which is given a tag of Ramsar site, fine. Next, so it is also an important uh, water bird habitat and it is used as a breeding and nesting site by many aquatic as well as land based birds. Which birds? Birds like Palas fish eagle, Palas fish eagle, Indian skim, uh, skimmer, Indian skimmer and common pocard, common pocard. These are the birds along with grey lag goose, grey lag goose, fine. And apart from that, there is also a critically endangered tree that is seen in this particular uh, wildlife sanctuary, Khijadia wildlife sanctuary called Indian uh, Delium tree, Indian Delium tree. Fine, so often, often we think that IUCN's red list is only for animals, that is not the case, right? Even plant species are also listed under IUCN's red list. So this plant species, Indian, Indian uh, Delium, De Indian Delium tree is a part of critically endangered plant species, fine? Can you please tell me third type under IUCN's red list? IUCN's red list is about plants, animals and Vermin, fungus, fungus species are also listed under IUCN's red list. Plants, animals and fungus, they are also listed under IUCN's red list. Fine. Right, so that is about Khijadia wildlife sanctuary. Next is, uh, so in that box, in that box they have defined wetlands. What are wetlands? Wetlands are the habitats where water is a key component to determine the environment, fine. There, 
there are certain examples of wetlands wetlands include swamps marshes so i hope you are aware of swamps and marshes what are swamps and marshes swamps are woody woody wetlands swamps are woody wetlands marshes are grasses right those wetlands which are dominated by grasses are called as marshes now third term is there billabongs what are they billabongs these are nothing but oxbow lakes billabongs are it is an it is australian term for oxbow lakes billabongs fine next now now uh, next article is about ramsar convention so you must be aware ramsar convention was signed in sorry water fence just a minute huh? okay fens are are peatlands fens are peatlands right uh, you must be aware of two uh, of uh, of a term called as bogs right what are bogs Bo bogs are also peatlands right what are peat uh, what are peatlands peatlands are those wetlands where we have partially decayed plant material right we have partially decayed plant material and examples of uh, peatlands are bogs and fence bogs and fence are the examples of peatland so fence are peatlands so next term is also peat box right so peatlands are uh, it is a larger term its examples of are fence and box next now ramsar convention so this is this is important topic uh, because if you go through previous year questions you will find number of questions that upsc asks on ramsar so when it came into being ramsar convention 1971 fine and uh, its enforcement started in 1975 and ramsar convention it is also called as convention on conservation of wetlands where where actions will be of national government and national governments will be receiving cooperation from international agencies right actions will be of national government ramsar list is not given by any international organization or ramsar tag is not given by any international organization it is given by government itself it is given in our case it is given by mof and cc right so action will be national but cooperation they will receive from international agencies so ramsar convention as you are aware of has three important pillars it works on three important pillars which are they three important pillars it works on three important pillars wise use of wetlands wise use of wetlands and and its resources so this term is important wise use we have discussed it wise use to is is that use which will ensure that there is no change in the ecological characteristic of the wetland second fine list of internationally important wetlands member countries should come up with a list of internationally important wetlands and internationally important wetlands are nothing but ramsar sites they are nothing but ramsar sites and third criteria fine international cooperation international cooperation 
for transboundary for transboundary wetlands fine so these are these are three pillars of ramsar convention and on the basis of these three pillars they are trying to ensure wetlands conservation they are trying to en ensure wetlands conservation fine so apart from these three criteria uh, these three pillars of ramsar convention for conservation of wetlands in order to come up with internationally important wetlands ramsar convention has given nine criterias out of which any one should be satisfied by that particular wetland to be to be an internationally important wetland can you please tell me about those nine criterias a wetland should be rare and unique and it should be natural or near natural wetland right it should be rare unique natural or near natural wetland that is first criteria and that's why as they have used this term near natural as they have used this term near natural even artificial sites human made sites can be declared as internationally important wetlands or ramsar sites fine so this term can you give me an example of this हरी के लेक इन आपके यहां इन पंजाब इट इज देयर इन पंजाब हरी के लेक इज देयर इन पंजाब राइट सो दैट इज आर्टिफिशियल साइट इवन नांदूर मध्यमेश्वर कहा हमारे यहां यस इट इज देयर इन नाशिक महाराष्ट्र फाइन नेक्स्ट क्राइटेरिया it should be a habitat for the species of water birds right and there are two criteria of this 1% species should be a given habitat or 20000 or more right so that is the criteria next criteria it should be a uh, ground for fishes spawning ground nursery food uh, resource migratory route for fishes right so there are two three criteria related to fishes spawning ground spawning ground means fine laying of eggs spawning grounds nursery nursery then uh, source of food source of food and also migratory migratory route and then if it is a habitat for non avian if it is a habitat for non avian species then also it can be declared as internationally important wetland so total nine criterias are there related to uh, related to ramsar sites any one criteria should be satisfied in order to get entry into ramsar list fine so montrix record they have they have given in this article we have already discussed no need to discuss again next so uh, you must be aware of recent ramsar sites how many ramsar sites are there right now in india 75 ramsar sites are there and recent additions are there in the state of tamil nadu and also in mizoram right and uh, three in three states they have made uh, recent additions first tamil nadu second is mizoram and one more mp madhya pradesh right so you should be aware of those sites next next uh, 14th uh, sorry 13th article is not very important udaipur's bird village to be declared as wetland right so it is not very important it will be declared as wetland then we'll see it right. next aravalli biodiversity park aravalli biodiversity park now this article is important so aravalli uh, aravalli biodiversity park has been declared as india's first other effective area based conservation measure 
O E C M by by I U C N, right? O E C M tag is given by I U C N. And what are what are O E C Ms? O E C Ms are those areas which are not a part of protected areas. They are not a part of protected areas that we discussed earlier, but they are taking in situ conservation measures which are effective for the conservation of biodiversity. Those areas are called as OECM. Fine. OECM areas are the areas which are not a part of any protected area, but despite that, they are taking certain in situ conservation measures that help in the conservation of biodiversity. Fine. And this tag is given by IUCN. So that is an important article. Next now, what is in situ conservation? In situ conservation means conservation in natural habitat of species creation of protected areas is a is an in situ conservation measure other conservation measure is called as ex situ that means conservation outside their natural habitat can you give me any example of ex situ conservation zoos aquariums uh, then artificial breeding centers botanical grounds etc Right, so there we are taking conservation measures outside the natural habitat. Fine. Next, so Aravalli Biodiversity Park. See, Aravalli Biodiversity Park is not as as it has got OECM uh, tag. It is not a part of any protected area. Right, it is just a park where we have uh, diversity of life, and that's why it is also called as Aravalli Biodiversity Park. It is not a recognized protected area. Right. So here we have semi-arid vegetation. Along with that, uh, it is an area where we are uh, we are facing problems because of the mining activity. Right, mining and quarrying activity is dominant in this place, and that's why there are threats that are being faced by Aravalli Biodiversity Park. Next, next is Kaziranga became become net carbon emitter. Kaziranga become net carbon emitter. What is that? But but uh, ideally, as it is a vegetation, it should it should uh, take or it should act as a sink for carbon. But why it is emitting? Animals. How animals? Fine, fine. So that can be one of the reason. Fine. So uh, net carbon emitter. And net carbon emitter means greenhouse gases are getting emitted. Are getting emitted from Kaziranga. Through which activities? Through which activities? First activity, as he has pointed out, animals. As a natural process of digestion of food, they emit methane. Right? They carry out fermentation of food in their gut. And as a result of that, they emit methane. Anything else? Any other activity? Any other activity? See, in Kaziranga, adjacent to Kaziranga, there are paddy fields, right? There are paddy fields, and you must be aware, wetlands are a source of methane. Wetlands are also a source of methane. How methane is emitted from wetlands? Right. Again, in wetlands, water lock conditions will be there. In paddy fields, water lock conditions will be there. And due to those water lock conditions, there will be anaerobic bacteria that thrive. Those anaerobic bacteria carry out uh, their own activities of respiration through which they emit methane. Right. Any other source? Any other source? You see, it is not only about methane. It is not only about methane. 
any other source due to which uh, Kaziranga is acting as net carbon emitter. In that region forest fire, it is a wet region, right. Any other reason? Sorry? Low rainfall, how does uh, it add to uh, carbon emission? No. Slash and burn. It is not uh, too prevalent in, in the state of Assam, right? It is there in other uh, states of Northeast, not in Assam. It is, it is also because of the deforestation activities like deforestation because forest act as a carbon sink. If forest is not there, there will be emission of carbon which has sinked not only in vegetation but also in soil, right. That carbon starts getting emitted, right. And also because of deforestation activity, uh, there will be increase in the decomposition by uh, organ by, uh, by microbes of organic matter and we know that decomposition is an oxygen intensive process leading to emission of carbon dioxide, leading to emission of carbon dioxide and that is why it is acting as a, it is acting as a net carbon emitter, fine. Next. So uh, where is Kaziranga National Park? It is there in Assam. So, uh, it is an area which is dominated by Brahmaputra flood plains. It is also an international, uh, sorry, important bird area declared by BirdLife International. And it is home for world's most one horned rhinos. Number of world's, uh, number of one horned rhinos are more in Kaziranga. And apart from, apart from this uh, one horned rhino, it is also famous for elephants, royal Bengal tigers and Asiatic wild, Asiatic water buffaloes, right. Apart from rhinos, royal Bengal tigers, elephants and water buffaloes, Asiatic water buffaloes are also present in Kaziranga. Next, next is Sariska Tiger Reserve. Sariska Tiger Reserve, we have already discussed it. So why Sariska came into news? Because there is a relocation of sloth beer, sloth beer. So sloth beer in Hindi is called as Bhalu, right. So uh, its IUCN status is vulnerable. It is a schedule one animal and also it is a part of appendix one of sites. So it has been relocated in the uh, Sariska tiger, tiger Reserve. Next now, next is Black Sea Biosphere Reserve, Black Sea Biosphere Reserve. So why it came into news? Because it is getting damaged because of Russia-Ukraine war, fine. So uh, this Black Sea Biosphere Reserve is not only a part of WNBR, World Network for Biosphere Reserves. It is also a Ramsar site. It is also a Ramsar site, WNBR. So let us discuss few points about Biosphere Reserve or WNBR, not Biosphere Reserve, WNBR. World Network for Biosphere Reserves. WNBR, World Network for Biosphere Reserves, WNBR. So uh, you must be aware of one, one program called as Man and Biosphere Program. Man and Biosphere Program or MAP. When it was initiated? 1971 by, by UNESCO, by UNESCO. So what is the goal of MAB program? 
what is the goal why map program was started see the most important dilemma that we have in uh, that we have in modern times is that how to balance development and and in conservation of environment so that solution we are trying to find through map program right what we are trying to do through map we are trying to balance development and environmental conservation development and environmental conservation is being balanced through map program fine so for this we'll have to carry out certain sustainable development practices for the balance between environment and development we'll have to carry out sustainable developmental practices right and these sustainable developmental practices are demonstrated in world network for biosphere reserves they are demonstrated in or instead of saying like that these are demonstrated in biosphere reserves these are demonstrated in biosphere reserves and and there is a network of these biosphere reserves called as wnbr there is a network of these biosphere reserves called as wnbr world network for biosphere reserves where if let's say there are there is a uh, biosphere reserve in in india and in this biosphere reserve we have found out certain sustainable development practice so that sustainable development practice can be implemented in let's say black sea black sea biosphere reserve and that's why there is a kind of network between these biosphere reserves so best practices will be reflected in different parts of world inside biosphere reserves falling under or uh, which are a part of wnbr fine so that is wnbr next now next topic is is ranipur tiger reserve where ranipur tiger reserve is there in chitrakoot district of uttar pradesh and it has been it has been created as a tiger reserve 53rd tiger reserve one more uh, area they have given is ramgarh vishdhari uh, wildlife sanctuary ramgarh vishdhari where it is it is there in the state of rajasthan and it is the fifth it is the fifth tiger reserve in the state of rajasthan earlier we have discussed four now this is the fifth one right so total five are there in rajasthan right <coughs> ramgarh vishdhari we discussed earlier okay sorry okay four, four only along with ranthambore sariska and mukundra uh, this is the fourth one right right next now next is uh, pantanal wetland so it is not very important it is there in south america i think in ecuador it is right not very important next now hasdo forest hasdo forest it is there in the uh, state of chatisgarh hasdo forest and it is the largest unfragmented forest in central india consisting of pristine sal and teak right this is a feature of it largest unfragmented forest in central india consisting of sal and teak can you please tell me the category of forest or uh, sal and teak are the species of which forest deciduous moist and dry both right both in moist and dry deciduous you will find uh, sal and teak right next and this forest falls under uh, tribal area of korba sujapur and sarguja district of chatisgarh which river hasdo forest is is along with hasdo river hasdo river which is a tributary of mahanadi hasdo river which is a tributary of mahanadi fine next now 
next is protect elephants so i i think it should be project elephant fine because the description is of project elephant only be beneath it there is a description of project elephant fine so elephants are a part of schedule 1 of wildlife protection act where they have given highest protection also they are a part of appendix 1 of sites and then they are also a part of appendix 1 of cms when they were ad added in appendix 1 of cms they were added in cop 13 held in 2020 right last cop of cms held in 2020 led to addition of asian elephants in the first appendix of cms fine and we have discussed already discussed even great indian bustard and bengal florican were also added in appendix 1 next next uh, let us discuss few points for project elephant project elephant can you please tell me when it was started 1990 1992 it is a centrally sponsored scheme of ministry of environment forest and climate change it is a centrally sponsored scheme of moef and cc can you please tell me what are centrally sponsored schemes fine that is there that is there but centrally sponsored schemes have a very important feature what is that fine that that sharing will vary it is 60 40 some same uh, in for special category states it is 90 10 right so that will vary centrally sponsored schemes so centrally sponsored schemes are started by central government on state list subjects right they are started by state government on state list subjects and why they started why they started because central government is representative of india in the international forums right let's say there are targets related to conservation of elephants let us consider there are no tar targets as such but let's say there are targets related to conservation of elephants so it is not that state of karnataka or kerala will be asked why you are not taking actions with respect to conservation of elephants it is government of india who will be asked why you are not taking actions for the conservation of elephants and that's why in order to abide by in order to fulfill international obligations in order to fulfill those international obligations central government start centrally sponsored schemes on state list subjects fine and then there is a funding mechanism 60 40 75 25 90 10 etc etc fine next so uh, project I, project elephant is a centrally sponsored scheme and there are three goals of project elephant can you please tell me first protection of elephants their habitat and their migratory corridors that is first goal protection of elephants their habitat and their migratory corridors second prevention fine prevention of man animal conflict man elephant conflict prevention of man elephant conflict and third one welfare of elephants in captivity right there are welf there are elephants in captivity now let, let me explain this point welfare of elephants in captivity the welfare of elephants in captivity so this is one of the goals of project elephant and project elephant is a is a uh, scheme of ministry that means government so government itself is recognizing that there are elephants in captivity right schedule one animal can it be kept in captivity can it be kept in captivity it is a schedule one animal under wildlife protection act 1972 so there was one exception made in wildlife protection act 1972 and that is for elephants elephants 
because when that act was enacted in 1972, there were certain elephants which were already under captivity. And that's why exception was made for elephants in 1972 act. But it was also said that domestication should not continue thereafter. That means whichever, whatever uh, elephants we have right now, they can be dem uh, domesticated. Their, their, uh, means their owners will continue their domestication. But new elephants should not be should not be domesticated. But this provision was not followed in its letter and spirit. And that's why domestication of elephants continued. Right? And in the bill of 2021, Wildlife Protection Amendment Bill 2021, it explicitly recognizes elephants uh, or it exempts elephants for various religious and other activities. Right? That means the uh, caveat that they put in uh, 1972 act was removed. Now it is allowed to be domesticated for religious and other activities. Fine. So elephants in India can be domesticated. Fine. Next. So uh, how, many, how many elephants are there in India? As per the census of 2017, there are 27,312 27, uh, elephants and highest number of elephants are there in the state of Karnataka. Karnataka, then Assam and then Kerala. Fine. And then we have uh, elephant reserves in order to implement the goals of project elephant, we have elephant reserves. So Agastemala is the elephant reserve which is shared which is shared by Kerala and Tamil Nadu. Can you name few other elephant reserves? Singhbhum elephant reserve, where? In the state of Jharkhand, Mayurbhanj, fine, where? Odisha. Anything else? Nilgiri, Vayanad, then uh, Garo Hills, Karbi Anglong. Right? So many are there, are almost 32 elephant reserves are there in India. Fine. Next. Next is Bandhavgad. Bandhavgad Tiger Reserve. So Bandhavgad Tiger Reserve is in state of Madhya Pradesh. And it is famous for population of Royal Bengal Tiger. And also animals like, like White Tiger leopards and deer fine and why it is in use because few caves were identified in Bandhavgur tiger reserve and those caves are associated with Mahayana sect of Buddhism fine so this is history topic next Sukha Paika river Sukha Paika river in Odisha uh, is getting is getting damaged or it is drying up because of the canal built over it called as Tala Danda Canal System. Tala Danda Canal System built on this river is leading to drying up of Sukapaika River. And that's why NGT has ordered that this river should be restored in its original, its uh, restored should uh, in original shape. Fine. Not very important. Next now. So this is the article, 24th article, Tamil Nadu's first biodiversity heritage site, Aritapatti village. Fine. And we have already discussed it. Aritapatti uh, biodiversity heritage site was declared by the state of Tamil Nadu. And who recommends it? SBB, State Biodiversity Board recommends it. Fine. And there is no fixed criteria as such. There is no fixed criteria which site should be recognized as BHS. So first biodiversity uh, heritage site was Nalur Tamarind Groove in Bengaluru. And it is there in the state of Karnataka. It was created in 2007. And other, other BHS are also given. You can go through the list of it. Fine. 
So that is about the protected areas which are in news. Now one more exercise you should do is that uh, if you get any other protected area which is there in news, try to find out its location. Secondly, the type of vegetation that it is associated with, animal species, right? which kind of animals are representative in that particular uh, protected area. Fine. Rivers, is, uh, is it crisscrossed by any river? That also you should uh, try to find out and the tags that it have, is it a biodiversity uh, heritage site or is it a, uh, it cannot be biodiversity heritage site because biodiversity heritage site cannot be created in existing protected areas. Is it a important bird area? Is it a part of biosphere reserve? So any additional tag, if it is there, try to find out those tags as well, right? So if you have, let us say 30 uh, protected areas with this kind of uh, with this kind of uh, detailing, this kind of information related to those protected areas, you can use this information. I am not saying that those 30 uh, will help you solve questions, right? 30 may say aa jayega. No, it is not like that. But you can use that information to solve questions, fine? So do this exercise for at least 30. I think 7 to 10, uh, 8 to 10 are there in this particular list only. Add. 20 more protected areas which are important as per you from the exams point of view, it will help you a lot. Fine. Next now, now we will discuss few species. We will discuss few species. You can come to page number. So we yesterday we discussed about dugongs, right? The last topic that we discussed was dugongs. So you can come to page number 24, page number 24, 19th topic, 19th. So there are close to 80 species, today we will do something, some species, we will have to divide it otherwise discussing only species will be very cumbersome, right. So we will do up to 40, uh, 40 45 and rest of the species will do tomorrow, fine. Next, so 19th, white cheeked macaw. So it is a newly discovered mammal species, white cheeked macaw, where? In the central Arunachal Pradesh. It has been uh, discovered at central Arunachal Pradesh. Fine, and who discovered it? Zoological Survey of India. Zoological Survey of India, Z ZSI. Where it is located, Zoological Survey of India is located in Kolkata, formed in 1916, located at Kolkata, formed under MOEF and CC, Ministry of Environment, Forest and Climate Change. Fine. And as this uh, white cheeked macaw is a new species, it is not a part of Wildlife Protection Act 1972 and that is why we are also not aware of its IUCN status, fine. So that is 19th. Next, 20th uh, we have already discussed, 20th we have already discussed. Next, 21st, so uh, there is a bird species which is which was found in northern Ecuador whose IUCN status is critically endangered, not important. See those, those topics where you have uh, these biological names, those topics are not very important and that too, this is a species of Ecuador, right? So obviously it will not be very important. Next, next is Glycosmis albicarpa, right? Again, this is a, uh, this is a biological name, but what is significant about this, this species has uh, medic medicinal values also it can be used as a source of food and it has been discovered by Botanical Survey of India from Kanyakumari Wildlife Sanctuary in Tamil Nadu, discovered by BSI, Botanical Survey of India from Kanyakumari Wildlife Sanctuary and this species is endemic to southern western ghats endemic to southern western ghats. 
right? And as we have already discussed, they have uh, medicinal values and also they can be used as a source of food. And berries of uh, this species have a specific aroma called as gin aroma. They have specific aroma called as gin aroma and they have these berries are popular as edible fruit. Next now, Botanical Survey of India, where it is located, again Kolkata, under which ministry? Ministry of Environment, Forest and Climate Change, BSI is also a part of Ministry of Environment, Forest and Climate Change, formed in 1890. Next now, next is Indian Grey Hornbill, Indian Grey Hornbill. So, uh, in Gujarat, they are reintroducing Indian grey hornbill in Gir forest from Himachal Pradesh. From Himachal Pradesh, it is being reintroduced and it is a common hornbill found only in Indian subcontinent. Indian grey hornbill is a bird species which is only found in Indian subcontinent. Next, its IUCN status is least concern and they are arboreal in nature. Obviously, birds, they are arboreal in nature only. What, are, what is arboreal? Tree, tree dwellers they are. Fine. Next. Uh, there is one, uh, there is next topic, 24th. And it is a species, it is a fossil that they have discovered. And that fossil is named after US President, Bideni. Right, it is named after US President, Bideni. Not important. Next, next is important, 25th, Halari donkey, found in Gujarat's Saurashtra region and there, there was local convention for, uh, for the conservation of these Halari donkeys. Why they are important? They are important because this, uh, the milk of these donkey consists of anti, antioxidants milk of donkey, uh, halari donkey consists of antioxidants. What are antioxidants? Fine, fine. What are antioxidants? Yes. You have a neat background, no? that's why I am asking. Three years back, fine. So antioxidants, see in our body when uh, food is processed, it leads to release of certain free radicals. Those free radicals we need to remove otherwise they react in an unintended manner and that's why we use antioxidants. Antioxidants help us remove those free radicals from our body, right? And this milk has those antioxidant properties, fine? And this uh, Harari donkey is an endangered species. It's an endangered species. Next now, next sawfish, sawfish. So, sawfish is uh, a fish that we, that uh, resembles saw, right, saw, uh, you must have seen that instrument, not instrument, saw, so, ari, 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 right. So, their, their uh, mouth is like saw and these uh, sawfishes, they are listed in critically endangered category. Fine. And they are also a part of IU, uh, Schedule 1 of Wildlife Protection Act 1972. Next. Uh, one more point, one more point for these sawfishes. They are closely related to sharks and that's why they are also called as flat sharks. Sawfishes are also called as flat sharks given their close relation with sharks. Next now, this is important, Himalayan Griffon vultures, Himalayan Griffon vultures, IUCN status, near threatened, near threatened. So Himalayan Griffon vultures, they are generally not found in the southern parts of India, but they were, means there was sighting of Himalayan Griffon vultures in the state of Telangana, right? So this is considered as a new distribution, new range for Himalayan Griffon vultures. Fine. And uh, their prime habitat is 
Himalayas along with Tibetan Plateau. Himalayas along with Tibetan Plateau is their prime habitat. Next, uh, 28th is not important. Next now, 29th, rough tooth dolphin. Rough tooth dol dolphin. So this is the uh, species of dolphin primarily found in tropical and deep warm waters around the globe. And this is the animal that has no subspecies. Right? These animals, rough tooth dolphin, they do not have any subspecies. Next, hornbill. Hornbill. These hornbills are called as frugivores. They are called as frugivores. What does that mean? They feed on fruits. They feed on fruits. Fine. Uh, and these hornbills are distributed across sub-Saharan Africa, Indian subcontinent, Philippines, uh, Indonesia and also in Solomon Islands. Fine. And in India, they are found in Western Ghats as well as in Northeastern states. Next now. India is a home to nine uh, species of hornbills and except one called as Oriental Pied Hornbill, all are listed under Schedule 1, right, except one. Uh, if you go through the list, last is Oriental Pied Hornbill, which is least concerned. Others are near threatened or vulnerable. Even Indian Grey Hornbills are least concerned. So except Oriental Pied Hornbills, all Hornbill species are a part of Schedule 1 of Wildlife Protection Act 1972. Next now, olive ridleys, olive ridley turtles and operation related to them called as operation save kurma. So you must be aware they carry out their nesting and breeding activity called as aribada. That activity is called as aribada and it is carried out on the eastern coast especially in the Odisha, Gahirmata coast of Odisha. And they are the smallest and most abundant of all sea turtles found across the world. And they are carnivores. Olive ridley turtles are smallest, most abundant, found in Indian Pacific as well as Atlantic Ocean. They are carnivorous in nature. Fine. And their uh, sanctuary is known as? Not, now, not their sanctuary, uh, but they carry out uh, nesting and breeding activity in Gahirmata Marine Sanctuary. Gahirmata Marine Sanctuary. What is their IUCN status? It's vulnerable. Vulnerable. And they are a part of Schedule 1 as well as Appendix 1. Now, this, this point is important. This is Operation Olivia. What is that? Operation Olivia is an operation carried out by Indian coast guards. It is carried out by Indian coast guards for the uh, for the breeding and nesting purposes of olive ridley turtles. Right? Operation Olivia. Next. Next is uh, Ganoderma lucidum. So there is a mushroom species which grow only on wood. Right? This mushroom can only grow on wood. And uh, it has some important uses and that's why they are experimenting uh, its growth in, in, uh, artificially, in artificial settings, they are trying to grow it, fine. So it prefers broadleaf tree species like acacia, poplar, oak, maple, eucalyptus, etc. And they are trying to grow it in warm and humid conditions. Uh, in in artificial settings as well, right? So that is what is Ganoderma lucidum. Next, Indian tent turtle, Indian tent turtle. So Indian tent turtles are found in freshwater rivers as well as in swamps and swamps are, swamps are wetlands. They are Schedule 1 animals under Wildlife Protection Act 1972 and they are on the verge of extinction due to illegal mining activity carried out in river river Narmada. Illegal mining. So if, if question is asked, threats of sand mining, 
sand mining even leads to uh, harmful impacts on the marine species. How? Because their habitat is getting destructed. How their habitat is getting destructed? Because they carry out their nesting and breeding activities on the, on the uh, sand of rivers. And if sand mining is carried out, that disturbs the activity of nesting and breeding. That eventually disturbs the, uh, the life cycle of these, uh, these turtles, threatening their survival. Fine. IUCN status is least concern. Next now. Next is pino, uh, Spinosaurus. Spinosaurus are the first known aquatic dinosaurs. And uh, this, was, this fossil was found in Morocco in Africa. Right? That much is sufficient. Spinosaurus, they are aquatic dinosaurs. Fossil was found in Morocco, Africa. Right? Because there may be a question, Spinosaurus, sometimes seen in the news. Because there was one question on dinosaurs, right? So there was a question on uh, dinosaurs, I think 2021, right? So that's why this is important. So in the case of uh, Indian tiger turtle, yes. uh, there is this line, there are no reports to indicate that Indian tiger turtle is on the point of extinction. Okay, there are no reports. Achha, sorry, sorry, yes. There are no reports to indicate that Indian tiger turtle is on the world. Sorry, there is a correction. They are not. Uh, they are not getting threatened because of illegal mining. Uh, but there are no reports that illegal minings of uh, in the uh, Narmada River threatens the survival of Indian tent turtles. So please make that correction. If you have written it, please make that, make that correction. Next, Plum King. So it is a uh, it is a butterfly species found in in the state of Tamil Nadu. It was spotted in the state of Tamil Nadu. Generally, it is found in state of Kerala. Fine, and uh, its distribution is there in the state of, uh, in countries like India, Myanmar, Indochina, Peninsular Malaysia, and Thailand. Fine. Next now. Next is uh, Vaquita porpoise. Vaquita porpoise. So uh, they are the smallest membra uh, members of Cetacean family. To and this family is also a family of whales, porpoises, and dolphins. Right? They are the smallest of this Cetacean family, which is also a family of whales and dolphins. Fine. Uh, and their name in Spanish mean little cow. Vanquita, vaquita porpoise in Spanish mean little cow. And their uh, preferred habitat is Gulf of California, which is there in, the, uh, in Mexico, Gulf of California. And they are getting threatened. Uh, vaquita porpoise are getting threatened because of accidental entanglement with fishing nets. They are a bycatch. During fishing activity, they are a bycatch. And that's why they are getting threatened. IUCN status is critically endangered. Next now. Next, there is a, a species of shrimp which was discovered uh, from Agathi Islands of Lakshadweep. And it is named as Actini. Actini men menes koyas, not very important. So, what is important? Koyas community, right? Koyas community. It is uh, it is the community in Lakshadweep, right? So that is important fact. And Agathi Islands, they are also a part of Lakshadweep. Next, thirty-eight topic is not important. 39th is very important. 39th is very important. Gray slender loris. Because first ever sanctuary for slender loris was created in the state of Tamil Nadu. Right? And it is there in the uh, Karur and Dindigul district of Tamil Nadu. In Karur and Dindigul district, there is first sanctuary for gray slender loris. They are small nocturnal mammals, 
नेटिव टू इंडिया एज वेल एज श्रीलंका नेटिव टू इंडिया एज वेल एज श्रीलंका आयुसियन स्टेटस एंडेंजर्ड आयुसियन स्टेटस इज एंडेंजर्ड एंड वन ऑफ द इंपॉर्टेंट सर्विस दैट दीज दीज लॉरिस प्रोवाइड इज दैट दे फीड ऑन बायोलॉजिकल पेस्ट एंड दैट्स वाई दे हेल्प फार्मर्स दे फीड ऑन बायोलॉजिकल पेस्ट एंड दस Uh, they help farmers fine so this is important 39th is an important topic next 40 is not important 41st emperor penguin emperor penguin it is the tallest and heaviest of all living penguins and it is endemic to antarctica it is endemic to antarctica and it is world's deepest diving bird right this is the world's deepest diving penguin and it can reach up to the depth of 550 meters and they are getting threatened because of climate change right because their habitat is glaciers and glaciers are retreating because of climate change and that's why there is a threat to these emperor dolphins next 43 Uh, a new snake species was discovered from umroi military station in meghalaya yesterday we we came across one gecko lizard so that was also discovered from this this region right so umri uh, umroi uh, military station in meghalaya one snake species is found and this snake species is there in meghalaya mizoram and and even in guwahati that means in assam next next is money money spider it is commonly found in europe but now it was discovered in mega uh, in wayanad wildlife sanctuary right commonly found in europe but discovered in wayanad money spider next wild boar wild boar they are the largest wild pig and they are native to north Uh, they are native to europe north africa india as well as china and in india they are scheduled three animals wild boars are scheduled three animals in india fine next next is sela macau sela macau again important a new species of old old world monkey was recorded in arunachal pradesh from west kameng district from west kameng district and it is genetically closer to arunachal macau and it is act, it is acting as a agricultural pest sela macau they act as agricultural pest fine next next is fishing cat fishing cat which is nocturnal in nature was was found in mangrove forest of sundarbans as well as chilka chilka lagoons on the foothills of uh, uh, along with that along with sundarbans and chilka lagoons also in the foothills of himalayas and one more location is western ghats so four locations sundarbans chilka foothills of himalayas and fourth is western ghats what is iucn status endangered next is saras green so it is a uh, non migratory crane found in indian subcontinent southeast asia as well as in australia and its iucn status is vulnerable and it is a part of schedule 4 fine so we'll uh, we'll discuss rest of the species tomorrow that does not mean class is getting over right just species we'll discuss tomorrow because it's very difficult to discuss species continuously fine so other species we'll discuss tomorrow now we'll discuss about climate change so how many species are left 85 are there right 86 86 species are there so again all species will not be important hardly 10 to 15 will be important those we'll discuss tomorrow fine next now next is climate change so uh, here in the in the first topic there are 
there are certain initiatives that were started that were initiated in the budget with respect to promotion of clean energy fine so first is national green hydrogen mission which you must be aware of so through so first of all what is green hydrogen fine green hydrogen so you must be aware uh, hydrogen is is a source of energy but it is not in free state right it is available in the form of water right and that's why in order to derive hydrogen from this from water molecule what we have to do we have to carry out electrolysis that means separation of hydrogen and oxygen so through electrolysis so electrolysis will help us get separate hydrogen from water right this electrolysis process is energy intensive this electrolysis process is energy intensive process fine right? now this energy can come from any source right it can come from any source it can be a renewable source of energy it can be a natural gas it can be uh, coal right it can be anything so which energy is being used for electrolysis of water on that basis carbon is uh, sorry on that basis hydrogen is named if we are using let's say renewable energy for it it will be considered as it will be considered as green hydrogen if for getting hydrogen we are using green energy if for getting hydrogen we are using green or renewable energy it will be called as green hydrogen but at the same time there are certain other types of hydrogen just a minute there are certain other types of hydrogen as well for example when we when we use coal based energy coal based energy for electrolysis it will be considered as black or brown hydrogen it will be considered as black or brown hydrogen next if we use renewable sorry if we use nuclear energy for this it will be considered as pink pink hydrogen it will be called as pink hydrogen fine if we use natural gas if we use natural gas for electrolysis if we use natural gas for electrolysis and along with natural gas if we use carbon capture and storage it will be called as it will be called as blue hydrogen fine if energy needed for electrolysis is derived from natural gas natural gas is it a fossil fuel yes it is right natural gas is a fossil fuel so when we use natural gas obviously there will be generation of certain uh, pollutants like carbon dioxide and all so if we are able to capture those those pollute uh, those emissions and if we are ensuring their long term storage in various reservoirs that technology is called as carbon capture and storage so natural gas along with carbon capture and storage will give hydrogen which will be blue hydrogen fine one more if natural gas is used if natural gas is used but no ccs 
what is that right natural gas is used but there is no carbon capture and storage that natural gas that uh, hydrogen will be called as gray that will be called as gray hydrogen that hydrogen will be called as gray hydrogen fine so these are different types of hydrogens that we have so under national green hydrogen mission we are promoting renewable energy for for electrolysis of water and thus to derive hydrogen <coughs> fine next now that means when we start using hydrogen as a source of energy will also have to promote will also have to promote renewable energy fine next and what is the target of government under national green hydrogen mission sorry by 2050 they under this mission they want to make india a uh, hub for green hydrogen right india uh, by 2050 will be made hub for green hydrogen right how much fine so uh, if there is a article we'll discuss it right right so uh, that is first national green hydrogen mission then energy transition investment Uh, was announced so that there is a transition towards renewable sources of energy then battery storage capacity will also be enhanced in india so yes green hydrogen target is 5 million tons 5 million tons by 2030 green hydrogen target is 5 million tons by 2030 fine so these are different schemes we'll come to next topic carbon bomb carbon bomb what is carbon bomb see carbon bomb means whenever we carry out any oil and gas exploration project that leads to emission of various amounts of that leads to emission of huge amount of carbon dioxide and that emission of carbon dioxide is considered as a kind of carbon bomb so this was the term used by uh, or this was the term which was uh, firstly used in the investigative uh, journalism by the guardian right in their journalism in 2022 we came across this term called as carbon bomb next so uh, why this term is important why this term is important carbon bomb because as per ipcc's reports as per ipcc's assessment reports which they have published since 1990 they have they have uh, said that especially in their fifth assessment report they have said that it is only 2900 gigatons of co2 equivalent that we can emit from 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 industrial revolution to or till not to till 2100 from industrial revolution till 2100 we can only emit this much of co2 right and as per this report fifth assessment report which was published in 2014 15 as per this report we have already emitted 1900 gigatons of co2 equivalent by 2011 itself right and if you go through sixth assessment report if you go through sixth assessment report there was a part release of sixth assessment report third part of sixth assessment report says that third part of sixth assessment report says that in 2019 we have emitted approximately 50 54 uh, billion tons of co2 equivalent 54 billion tons or gigatons of co2 equivalent 
right. So, this much of emission is being emitted only in one year and this emission though, though this six assessment report says that the rate of emission is falling, but we will be breaching the target that, that we have set under Paris climate deal by or before 2040. That is what is the observation of uh, IPCC's assessment report, six assessment report and that is why there is a need to reduce carbon emission. But with the exploration of new gas and oil wells, we are, we are adding more and more carbon dioxide into the earth's atmosphere and that is why uh, there is a need to curb this uh, emission as per the investigative journalism carried out by Guardian. Fine. So, that is second article. Third one, World Overshoot Day. It should be Earth Overshoot Day and we have already discussed it. What is Earth Overshoot Day? Earth Overshoot Day. This is the concept uh, that is given since 2006, right? And under this, what is being analyzed? Fine, right? So, Earth Overshoot Day. Earth Overshoot Day. See, from 1st January till 31st of December, from 1st January to 30, 31st of December, there will be certain, there will be certain resources that Earth will regenerate and that is what is called as that is what is called as bio capacity of earth, bio capacity, bio capacity of earth, right. And these resources that earth is generating under its bio capacity are being utilized by human beings on a certain day, right. We exhaust those resources uh, on a certain day and that day is called as earth overshoot day. In 2022, it was on 28th of July. When it was started, when this concept was started in 2006, first earth overshoot day was in October and from that we are just coming closer to January, right. So, that is the problem and there is one more report you must be aware it is living planet, living planet report given by, given by? Fine, WWF given by Worldwide Fund for Nature and this, this Living Planet report is based on two important indicators. First is Living Planet Index, Living Planet Index. Who gives Living Planet Index? It is given by Zoological Society of London. Right, Living Planet Index is given by Zoological Society of London wherein they analyze the impact of human activities on various animals, especially in marine ecosystem. So, it is based on Living Planet Report is based on Living Planet Index and, and ecological footprint, ecological footprint. ecological footprint. What is ecological footprint? A person, how much he uses the resources and how much he utilizes the resources. Fine. Fine. Right. See, we have discussed about bio capacity. What is bio capacity? Bio capacity is the capacity of earth to generate resources. Now, let us consider that the resources generated just a hypothetical number let us consider earth has generated 100 kilograms of resources in a year. Now, these resources will be used by human beings, right? And when we use these resources, we also will create uh, uh, waste, waste will be created. Let us say coal is generated by earth. When we use that coal, we will lead to emission of carbon dioxide, right? So, resources will be used by human beings and along with that, there will be creation of waste, right. There will be creation of waste by human beings. Now, to take care of the resources need 
and to address waste generated by human beings, there will be certain capacity of earth that will be needed. And that capacity is, need, is called as ecological footprint. Right? Ecological footprint is the need of resources of humanity along with that the resources needed to address waste generated by humanity. That is what is called as ecological footprint. Ideally, ecological footprint should be lesser than biocapacity. But as we have pointed out yes, yesterday, it is 1.56 times, right? Ecological footprint is 1.56 times biocapacity. And that is a problem. Fine? Next. So, uh, this Earth Overshoot Day is given by Global Footprints Network. It is a not-for-profit organization. Global Footprints Network. And uh, it is a not-for-profit organization in three countries, namely USA, Belgium and Switzerland. World Wide Fund for Nature also participates in, also participates in Earth Overshoot Day. Earth Overshoot Day is primarily given by Global Footprints Network, but along with that, World Wildlife Fund for Nature also participate in this, right? And their standalone, their own report is, is this, fine? Next, Arctic Amplification. Next article is Arctic Amplification. Arctic Amplification. What is that? Arctic Amplification. What is Arctic Amplification? It is a phenomenon. Fine, fine. Arctic Amplification is a phenomenon wherein there is more trapping up of heat in the Arctic region. And this heat is leading to loss of glaciers in that particular region. Uh, at a faster rate compared to other glaciers in different parts of the world, right? So that is what is Arctic amplification and it is caused by heat trapping emissions from the burning up of fossil fuels, fine? And there is no, there is no Antarctic amplification. There is only Arctic amplification that is uh, seen in the Arctic region of Earth. See, that is, not, uh, that is not the exact, means we are not able to find out exact reason why there is Arctic amplification occurring. Fine, it may be the result of, you can say it may be the result that it is uh, close to human activities. Arctic region is close to human activities. It is not the case with Antarctic region because in Antarctic it is surrounded more by water. Right? So that may be the reason. There may be more accumulation of fossil fuels because of human activities around Arctic region, fine. Next, next is urban flooding. Next article is urban flooding. So ideally this topic should be a part of mains, but fine, we will we'll discuss it. Urban, urban flooding, what is the main reason why we are witnessing increased instances of floods in urban areas? It is destruction of? Concretization, fine. Fine. Any other, anything else? Failed? Failed drainage system. TK. Anything else? Drainage system is getting failed. Fine. Fine. Urban flooding. Urban flooding. Right? You must have came across various instances where in cities like Bengaluru, Hyderabad, Pune, uh, Gurgaon, so these kind of cities are getting flooded. So wh what are the causes? First is, first and the most important is destruction of wetlands. Destruction of wetlands. Why? Because wetlands act as a sink they act as a sink for flooded waters. Flooded waters are, they, they get sinked inside uh, wetland regions. Fine, it, not, it may not be there, wetlands may not be there everywhere in all cities, right? But cities like Bangalore, 
Pune, they are getting uh, the they are seeing the instances of urban flooding because wetlands in those areas are getting destructed. Fine. Any other concretization? There is end-to-end -end concretization in cities. End-to-end -end concretization, and that's why there is hardly any space for water to percolate inside ground. And if water is not percolating, it will flow. And as a result of that flow of uh, of rainwater, there will be there will be urban floods that we will witness. Concretization, end-to-end -end concretization. Next. Fine, drainage, drainage system, fine, drainage system. Drainage system, old drainage system which is not able to uh, take, a, which is not able to handle the sewage that we are generating with increased population and that leads to blocking of uh, drainage system due to poor, due to poor solid waste management. Due to poor solid waste management, there is blockage, uh, there are blockages that are seen in drainage systems. Anything else? Sorry? Climate change, fine. Climate change. Anything else? Does urban heat island has any relation to do with uh, flooding, urban flooding? Yes, urban heat islands lead to increase in the amount of rainfall received in cities, received by cities, right. So, urban heat islands, urban heat islands, what are urban heat islands? Urban heat islands, uh, it is an effect seen in cities where temperature in cities will be more by more compared to the adjacent areas, right? And that is the result of use of, uh, that is the result of concretization, use of fossil fuels, uh, even use of AC machines, generators and all. Because these machines, they lead to emission of heat and that heat gets trapped inside the urban areas and as a result of that, urban areas have more temperature compared to vicinity. And this question was asked by UPSC way back in 2013 mains examination, urban heat islands, what are urban heat islands? Fine, so because of these region, regions, there is increased, there are increased instances of flooding. Fine, what is the impact of it? Impact, obviously means, uh, so as per this article, there will be loss of life, property, there will be ecological impact, right? Uh, impact on animal and human health and there will be uh, impacts in the form of aesthetic. Aesthetics features of that cities will be destructed, fine. Next now, marine heat waves and uh, do we have any guidelines given by NDMA with respect to urban floods? Yes, there are. NDMA has given guidelines with respect to urban floods where they talk about first and the most important focus of those guidelines is that by 31st of March, we should complete cleaning up of drainage systems, especially in those cities which are vulnerable to urban floods, but hardly that is followed. Next, marine heat waves, marine heat waves. Next is marine heat waves. So, uh, IPCC along with assessment reports also comes up with special reports. In 2018-19, it has came up with special report on, on oceans and cryosphere, wherein it has analyzed the impact of climate change on oceans as well as cryosphere. What is cryosphere? Frozen part of planet. Frozen part of planet is cryosphere, where temperature will be excessively lesser, fine. So, under that report, they have highlighted that there will be increased instances of El Nino, La Nina, Along with that, marine heat waves are also going to increase. Why? Why? Because as per this report, more than 90% of heat generated in Earth's climatic, Earth's atmospheric system is getting absorbed in oceans, right? And that will lead to, if oceans are absorbing heat, 
that will lead to marine heat waves fine so uh, this has been highlighted even in the sixth report wherein the uh, wherein ipcc says that sea surface temperature over indian ocean is likely to increase by 1 to 2 degree celsius where there is uh, where when there is 1.5 to 2 degree celsius global warming that means when we breach the target set by paris climate deal that will lead to increased temperatures on uh, in in indian ocean region fine what will be the impact of it what will be the impact of increased temperature fine so marine heat waves impact first is coral bleaching fine coral bleaching next is increased instances of cyclones fine tropical cyclones their frequency as well as intensity will increase fine fine less oxygen availability and this is a threat less oxygen availability why because solubility of oxygen reduces in warm water solubility of oxygen reduces in warm water and as a result of this reduced oxygen availability there will be there will be death of marine organisms marine organisms fine any other impact any other impact have you heard about urethermal urethermal aquatic organisms are urethermal what does that mean that is stenothermal okay so then then uh, fine 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 so they uh, then they are stenothermal fine sorry stenothermal fine stenothermal theek hai theek hai stenothermal so stenothermal are those animals which are which cannot tolerate long ranges large ranges of temperature aquatic organisms are stenothermal they cannot tolerate long ranges of large ranges of temperature fine and if marine heat waves are there obviously they will be compelled to migrate they will be compelled to migrate towards polar region and those who are not able to migrate they will they will go extinct eventually fine so that is one of the impacts stenothermals they are and that's why there will be forced migration forced migration ha huh. fine and why why these aquatic organisms are stenothermal why aquatic organisms are stenothermal fine specific heat of water is is more specific heat of water is more that means water in order to change temperature by 1 degree celsius will need more amount of heat energy and if that is the case water has a tendency to maintain its temperature if water maintains temperature aquatic organisms will be having less fluctuation in their habitat with respect to temperature and that's why they are stenothermal fine next uh, next in in one box there is a uh, they have talked about kelp forest kelp forest though kelp forest looks like forest it is not Uh, a vegetation right it is not uh, uh, aquatic vegetation it is algae it is algae right brown large brown algae uh, form kelp forest and especially this is found in temperate waters especially it is found in temperate waters and they have excessive growth 
they can grow up to the height of 145 meters and in one day they can grow up to the height of 40 meters if favorable conditions are available right they are they are brown algae fine next wet bulb temperature wet bulb temperature we have discussed it yes can you please tell me wet bulb temperature what is wet bulb temperature fine so uh, first of all why why this topic is there wet bulb temperature because ipcc in its sixth assessment report part 2 has talked about wet bulb temperature and it has talked about wet, wet bulb temperature from the perspective of india see ipcc never means before uh, sixth assessment report they never gave about gave regional or uh, regional or uh, uh, city based assessment of temperature for the first time they have given city based or regional assessment of uh, temperature conditions or climatic conditions and in the sixth assessment report part 2 they have talked about wet bulb temperature so wet bulb temperature what is that it is a temperature where where both uh, it is a temperature where temperature conditions will be high both temperature and humidity conditions will be high and how do we calculate wet bulb temperature wet bulb temperature is calculated by covering bulb of thermometer with wet cloth right bulb of thermometer will be covered with wet cloth in order to find out wet bulb temperature of that particular region so in wet bulb, bulb temperature both temperature as well as humidity will be high right so if this is the case what will happen if wet bulb temperature of a region is high what will happen fine fine so human beings they exhibit ability of homeostasis homeostasis it is a kind of response which is called as regulation it is a kind of response called as regulation we can regulate our body temperature right we can regulate our body temperature so that we can we will be able to maintain our internal environment at 37 degrees celsius that is the body temperature that that we have so we can exhibit the ability of homeostasis and homeostasis in human beings is exhibited through two processes which are there sweating and shivering spelling kya shivering theek hai fine aapko hi pata nahi theek hai no problem so when we when we shiver we create we generate uh, so shivering is a kind of body movement as body moves it leads to production of heat right and as heat is produced we will be able to maintain our body temperature at 37 degrees celsius sweating sweating when we sweat sweat is evaporated and due to evaporation of sweat there will be cooling effect right there will be cooling effect on our skin and that will allow us to maintain our internal temperature at 37 degrees celsius so that is what is homeostasis homeostasis can be exhibited by human beings but when both temperature and humidity conditions are high in the external environment our homeostatic ability fails sweat do not evaporate right when 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 uh, temperature is high we will sweat but humidity is also high and that's why there is no evaporation right because what is evaporation conversion of liquid into gas so already in uh, in air water vapor is more and that's why there is no scope of addition of extra 
water vapor which may be added through the process of evaporation of sweat. So that will not happen and that will lead to that will lead to uh, loss in the ability of homeostasis. If homeostasis is lost, we will not be able to regulate our body temperature and we'll, we will not be able to maintain it at 37 degrees Celsius. That will eventually lead to means uh, as per IPCC's report, 35 degrees Celsius temperature, 35 degrees Celsius wet bulb temperature. If human beings are exposed to this temperature for more than 6 hours, it is fatal. It is fatal. And if you have come across, if you have read recent articles on heat waves, heat wave conditions are going to increase in India. And that's why we should come up with some innovative solutions. Innovative solutions are like, first they have highlighted solution that uh, they have carried out in, that they have implemented in Canada. In Canada, there are cooling centers, right? Because in Canada already temperatures, temperatures do not change much. But due to climate change in Canada also temperatures are changing. There, there are increased temperatures that are being witnessed in Canada. So to cool down people in Canada, they have established cooling centers, right? Second important solution that is highlighted in the, uh, in the article mentioned in the Hindu is self-shedding buildings. We should come up with self-shedding buildings. Have you come across designs of buildings which are very odd, right? When we see it, I mean, like, ye kya bana diya? right? Bahar se bahut jali jali ka structure hoga and uh, in means under uske under wo proper building hogi, right? So that is what is shelf shedding building. Those buildings provide shade to themselves, right? And that will help them to ensure that their temperature do not increase much self shedding buildings and this is what is carried out in UAE. So this solution is used in UAE and one more is coal or cool roof. One more is cool roof, use of cool roof. What is that? Yes, fine, fine use of white tiles or white color paint on the roofs of buildings so that albedo increases, albedo increases, fine. So that is what uh, is the solution provided by, uh, solution highlighted in that particular article, fine. So wet bulb temperature is that temperature where both temperature and humidity conditions will be high, fine. But as of now, as of now, we have not crossed 31 degrees Celsius. If we uh, reduce emissions, we will be able to ensure that wet bulb temperature do not cross 31 degrees Celsius. But if we continue business as usual, by 2100, our temperatures will increase by increased more than 31 degrees Celsius. Wet bulb temperature I am talking about. Wet bulb temperature will increase more than 31 degrees Celsius and it may touch. 35 degrees Celsius, fine and if that is the case it may be fatal, right. So that is wet bulb. But generally this does not happen, why? Because whenever more humidity will be there, air is about to reach its saturation, right and if air, air is close to saturation, there are more chances of condensation or rainfall. Fine, so that's why it does not happen generally, but who knows in future. Next, carbon market. Now this is important. Carbon market, right? Recently government has uh, came up with amendment to Energy Conservation Act 2001. And under that, uh, government want to create carbon market. What is that? Carbon market. Have you heard about Bureau of Energy Efficiency? Is it a statutory organization? Bureau of Energy, these star marking and all, it is given by BE only. Is it a statutory organization? Yes, it is. Established in 2002 under Ministry of Power, 
under this act only energy conservation act 2001 so bureau of energy efficiency what is the mandate of bureau of energy efficiency what it is supposed to do bureau of energy efficiency see it is not only about when we talk about climate change solutions it is not only about uh, use of renewable energy it is also about energy efficiency we won't be able to migrate completely towards renewable energy we will be using fossil fuel based energy so for that fossil fuel based energy we should try for we should try for energy efficiency right that means we should make sure that our energy intensity reduces and that is the mandate of bureau of energy efficiency it works to increase the potential of india in energy efficiency and that's why it comes up with these standards uh, ratings for electronic uh, devices fine so in order to achieve energy efficiency in india bee implements one scheme called as perform achieve and trade right under perform achieve and trade what happens there will be targets there will be targets to different organizations let's say there is one cement industry it will be given some targets right so so similarly there will be targets to iron and steel industry let's say fine so iron and steel industry and cement industry will be having some target now let us assume that cement industry has exceeded its target whatever energy why these why these uh, examples i have taken because in these industries it is very difficult to use renewable energy they will continue their use of fossil fuels fine and that's why let's say uh, cement industry and iron and steel they have targets with respect to energy efficiency cement industry has exceeded its target let us assume cement industry has exceeded its target those exceeded targets it can sell to iron and steel industry which could not meet its target and that is what is perform achieve and if you achieve excessively trade right so that scheme will be implemented even for carbon there will be creation of carbon market under the uh, energy conservation amendment bill and that carbon market will also work on perform achieve and trade right and this kind of system is already there under kyoto but in a different form kyoto what is kyoto protocol fine it came into being in 1997 under third cop of UNFCCC wherein targets are there for annex countries targets are there for annex or developed countries fine and uh, under kyoto protocol phase 1 target was at least 5% reduction in the emissions of 1990s level between 2008 to 2012 and in the second phase which was between 2013 to 2020 target was at least 18% emission reduction of 1990s level right so in order to achieve these targets there were flexibilities under kyoto protocol and this was the question that they asked in 2022's mains examination mechanisms to implement kyoto protocol fine see uh, it acts as an incentive let's say uh, you have you have cement industry and you are able to uh, achieve your targets and you are able to exceed your targets so it acts as a one of the means of income right so what you will do you will again try to achieve more energy efficiency so that you will be able to sell it to iron and steel industry right so it acts as an incentive for use of more renewable energy and also 
it acts as a as a disincentive for non achievers right so it acts both ways right so kyoto protocol has certain flexibilities first is joint implementation joint implementation so this you must be aware of joint implementation second clean development mechanism clean development mechanism third international emission trading and this is what is perform achieve and trade international emission trading those who are able to achieve more emission reductions they can trade their emission reduction certificates with those countries which have not met their targets under kyoto right so that is what is international emission trading which is also there in which is there in kyoto protocol so similar mechanism will be used in perform achieve and trade fine next now so next article is geomagnetic storms i don't know why it is here geomagnetic storms is a topic of science and technologies but still we'll discuss it fine so done with this next now so this topic we'll discuss and then heat islands we'll discuss and then we'll stop so uh, next is geo geomagnetic storms so for this you should be aware of interplanetary magnetic field for understanding this you should be aware of interplanetary magnetic field what is that interplanetary magnetic field so sun sun's magnetic field is dragged towards planets let's say these are planets sun's magnetic field is dragged towards planet by solar winds and this dragged magnetic field fills up interplanetary spaces right it fills up interplanetary spaces and that that is what is called as interplanetary magnetic field interplanetary magnetic field is a part of sun's magnetic field dragged towards planets by solar winds fine now let us consider that this is earth earth has its own magnetic field right earth earth has its own magnetic field let's say this is the shape of it so this interplanetary magnetic field brought by solar winds interacts with interacts with earth's magnetic field that interaction leads to geomagnetic storms these storms are also called as solar storms right these geomagnetic storms are also called as solar storms so how they are produced it is the result of interaction between interplanetary magnetic field with earth's magnetic field fine so that is what is uh, interplanetary magnetic sorry that is what is geomagnetic storms or solar storms fine and they are harmful they may lead to damages to the uh, satellites which may be there in low earth orbit primarily fine so we'll discuss these topics in in science and technology it is ideally a topic of science and technology next next is urban heat islands which we have already discussed so you can go through this what are urban heat islands urban heat islands uh, 
uh, is a condition where local and temporary it is a local or temporary phenomenon in which certain pockets within a city are experiencing higher heat load than its surrounding areas why it happens it happens because of dark surfaces of buildings right dark surfaces reduces albedo right Sec uh, second air conditioning even you can add generators urban architecture end to end concretization third need for mass transport uh, transportation mechanism or use of fossil fuels in vehicles right and then lack of trees and green areas because of all these conditions heat is trapped and that trapped heat leads to increased temperatures in urban areas and that is what is urban heat islands right urban heat islands is also one of the reasons for increased heat wave conditions right increased heat wave conditions can you please tell me the exact definition of heat wave when we will call that heat wave has has started fine general condition you can tell fine 4.6 4.5 to 6.4 if normal temperatures are more than 4.5 to 6.4 degree celsius then that condition will be considered as a heat wave condition be it be it plains or hilly areas same criteria is there fine so urban heat islands may lead to heat wave conditions fine so we'll stop here today we are left with a uh, few other topics we'll discuss it tomorrow fine so we'll be able to complete it tomorrow right kya hua timing is 2 to 5 it's it was 3 to 5 i'm not very sure about that acha uh, it's 2 to 5 only fine any doubt any doubt if you have you may ask else we'll stop doubt no doubt fine thank you